we have just completed the symposium, the State of Artists Union, and today I am joined by Pastor Mark Robinson, John Harris, Dr. Stephen Shavura, Dr. Thaddeus Williams, and of course, Dr. Peter Jones. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to be here. Good to be here. Thank you. Dr. Jones and John Harris, first question for the day is, how does neo-Marxism go against specific ecumenical creeds, historic confessions? Don't these transcend neo-Marxism or critical race theory? Because isn't critical race theory aimed at how race has been embedded in American law and government, and it's not a theological move? Who did you want to go first on that? Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, the, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time because there's a lot of different directions this can go, but I think there's, there's a number of ancient heresies that you can parallel with the social justice movement, broadly speaking, critical race theory, of course, being an incarnation of that, which would fit into this, but you have um, kind of an agnostic element, which um, mm. parallels the standpoint theory where there are certain social groups or social locations that have more access to understanding or truth than other social locations. And mm. so you, you come away with uh, an understanding after um, reading some of these sources in critical theory that uh, seems to indicate that you won't have the full truth or the complete truth unless you get some kind of a marginalized perspective on things. And so that that's not too much different than some of the Gnosticism that was um, making its way around, even in some of the gospels, like first John talks about even the rudimentary kind of um, uh, starting the, what, what Gnosticism in its kind of rudimentary form. And um, of course it wasn't based on social location, but it was this idea that there were some who had greater access to knowledge um, and secret knowledge because of some external feature of some kind or some group that they were in. Uh, and then you have um, in, these would be a little more of a, a tentative um, connection, but you could look at the social justice movement and see underneath of it an undercurrent, I think, of Pelagianism and Marcionism as well in some ways. Um, and, and I think that manifests itself in kind of an egalitarianism, equity, diversity, and inclusion, where there's this idea that, that men um, are innately good and, and are going to share with others and live in this great society where we're not going to have any hierarchies or any unequal treatment or um, any disparities between social groups. And it's just a very naive view of man. It's not a biblical anthropology. And so um, I think underlying that is this idea that man can perfect himself, that we can create systems or structures or mechanisms by which to bring this about. And we just know that that's not true according to a biblical anthropology. Um, of course, uh, with Marcionism, kind of the exclusion of some of the Old Testament law. Um, and and th this doesn't apply to necessarily every single incarnation of people that are um, uh, affected by the social justice movement within Christian circles, but some of them certainly do throw out certain Old Testament concepts or the law, and they want to make it all, they, they kind of reduce the law down to just equality. And that's just, that's the purpose of the law and anything to bring that about, but they ignore some of the hierarchies and some of the um, the reasons that some laws are present. Um, so I, I do see sort of an undercurrent of Marcionism. And then of course, um, the main one, I think, because uh, this directly affects the gospel is Marxism. And, and Marxism is certainly embedded in the social justice and critical theories. Uh, has, at least when it <laughs> enters into Christianity, it, it comes with some level of Phariseeism or the Galatian heresy where, the, I, and I've actually been working on this recently um, and just lining up all these quotes from um, social justice advocates who try to introduce this into Christianity. And what they say is that you, you don't have the full gospel unless you have our recommendations for social change um, with, with your preaching of the gospel or your living out the gospel. And of course, the Galatian heresy was th that very thing, adding to the gospel, taking a law, taking something external and saying, well, you need this as well. It's something extra. And so I would think that you know th these um, different elements that I just mentioned would contradict many of the creeds. Well, that's very complete and very compelling. I simply, simply, simply add one element, and that is that this movement really shows no respect for the image of God. 
in human beings. Uh, half of the human beings are dismissed as worthless. Mm. And so we cannot speak with them. And that we do not find in scripture. We find a tremendous respect for the human being, for the human being's knowledge of himself and the ability to understand truth wherever it comes. And this, as John says, is a totally Gnostic view where only some special people know the truth and other people don't. And so it really does not fit at all with Orthodox Christianity. Cool. If I could just chime in briefly, um, <clears throat> building on some of uh, uh, Dr. Jones and, and John's insights there, think of, you know, if we were to time warp back to the first century, there's a lot of ethnic strife between Jews and Gentiles, and they could have played this never-ending game of grievances. Right? Right. The, the Jews could have said, well, you know, the Romans are just the latest iteration of the oppressors. And so if that got smuggled into the first century church, you know, you could have, say, you know, Judah the Jew sitting around the Lord's table, and he's scowling across the table at Rufus the Roman. And saying, you know, it was your ancestors. You know what your ancestors did to mine? Um, and, you know, Rufus the Roman could peer right back and say, well, I remember the Maccabean revolt and I lost my, my grandfather uh, at the hands of you, you unruly Jews. And they, they could have just played that never ending game of historic grievances. And it would have been, you know, planting C4 at the foundations of church unity. And so what does Paul do when he's, when he's writing to the Romans? He says in chapter 3, you know, he says, hey, Jews, you had the law. You broke it. You need the gospel. Hey, non-Jews, you don't get off the hook so easy. God wrote his law in your heart, and you break that too. So it kind of climaxes in Romans 3 with the famous passage that all have sinned, right? So going back to John's insight about social justice just not having a biblical anthropology, if we're starting scripturally, we recognize the universality of sin, the universality of fallenness, that before every tongue, tribe, and nation can be united in Christ, every tongue, tribe, and nation is, is united in the first Adam in our fallenness. Mm. And in my experience, that's just a wrecking ball through far mm. left and far right ideologies that would want to say, well, I'm innocent, I'm holy, mm. I'm justified because of my melanin level or my cultural heritage. Uh, I think Romans 3.23 just uh, undercuts that from both sides. Dr. Jones, you said that critical race theory or CRT was the mechanism of neo-Marxism, and yet many Christians see validity in it. Is there anything biblical in Hegel, Marx, and the new left realism that made Marxism personal? And if not, how might the biblical Christian win back their new left brothers and sisters? Well, gentlemen, very simply, and, gentlemen if you want to jump in after Dr. Jones, please feel free to do so. This almost sounds like the question you asked, almost like the kind of, can you use it as an analytical tool? I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking through, like, can, can you take any of this? And is there anything true to it that's useful somehow? Right. I was going to say that in as much as Marx and Hegel are made in God's image, we have things to learn from them, but people have to relate on the level of ideology and not simply the fact that human beings are interesting. It's what their overall theory produces that you mm. have to anal analyze so that you can say, I can successfully positively take away from these systems, material that can help me as a Christian. In that sense, Hegel was a materialist. Uh, in a certain sense, he believed, though, that spirit was moving everything. And so he, he really materialized or he spiritualized the material. And he saw that as the way that history goes forward. Marx himself, of course, one thing we can learn from this poor fellow who was pretty much a failure as a father and a husband is his concern 
for the suffering of the workers around him and the children that worked in factories and so on. I think we can learn to be concerned about suffering human beings from people who show that concern. But in terms of his way of bringing about healing and liberation of those suffering people, we have nothing to learn from him because he immediately denies the existence of God himself in any way as a factor to understand human existence. On Marx, um, I, I would add a few things and I, I agree with everything that, that Peter said, but um, we've got to remember that Marx himself was a product of his time. He was born in 1818 and he lived through, in a sense, the worst point of industrial capitalism in Western history. And for most of his life, he lived in London, um, which for a period of Marx's life had very laissez-faire laws regarding factory rules. And so so Karl Marx actually lives in the London that, uh, that, that we would think of if, you know, when we think of, say, a Dickensian novel or something like that. And so we can kind of understand why Marx may have been so critical of industrial capitalism. Uh, he was very much a product of his time. Um, now, we, we know in hindsight that, that Marx's prediction and the prediction of Marxists that industrial capitalism would lead to immiserization, that is workers' conditions getting increasingly bad, we know that that's just turned out to be false, that in actual fact, owing to technological changes, owing to evangelical reform movements all around uh, Europe um, and uh, in a, you know, uh, elsewhere, certainly in Australia, that the conditions and pay rates of workers actually got better as, as capitalism sort of marched on. Um, now, I mean, why, why was Marx so appealing at the time? Well, yeah, because, it, because at the time, uh, things were obviously pretty bad. Uh, but also, and this is an insight of the, the 20th century economist, Joseph Schumpeter, who pointed out that the intellectuals jump on the Marxist bandwagon uh, when Christianity is on the decline, as we, as everyone here would would would, would know, um, Marxism nicely uh, is a nice sort of analogy to much of Christianity with its own creation, fall, redemption narrative, um, and uh, it, it's not surprising that as intellectuals are sort of breaking up with Christianity, they're grasping onto Marx while they're on the rebound because it's kind of the most familiar thing to them uh, at the time. And I, I think that that's more or less happening right now at the popular level now with the decline of, of, of Christianity uh, at the popular level around the world. People are grasping onto things that kind of resemble the Christianity that, that, that they have a kind of cultural memory of. And whether that's sort of climate apocalypticism or, or woke politics, that's something that's going on. So why is it becoming so popular among Christians? I think because Christians are increasingly seeing themselves as uh, cultural aliens, and they're wanting to connect somehow with mainstream culture. And funnily enough, um, as mainstream culture is sort of grasping onto something that kind of resembles the former Christianity uh, that meant something to so many of them, wokeism, Christians in their effort to be culturally relevant are grasping onto the same wokeism as well because it's kind of familiar to them too. And so Christians in their desire to be culturally relevant are grasping on uh, to wokeism in a sense to say, hey guys, um, look, we agree with you on this big thing. We're not so far apart as, as you might think. Um, um, have, you, you know, have, have you considered um, the, the, the bigger story maybe of Christianity? Uh, so I think that, that that's one of the appeals of, of, for, for Christians of, of cultural Marxism and, and the wokest movement, that it's kind of their way of trying to reconnect with a culture that's sort of flying away from them, but still uh, maintaining quite a few cultural Christian tropes, um, no matter how misguided they are. I'll, I'll stop there and I, let others have a say. No, I like that. But as we talk about the... Um retreat of Christianity in the culture. I just got this book uh, yesterday. It's, it's a brilliant analysis of the God hypothesis showing that so many uh, scientists can no longer not understand some of the claims of the Bible 
as to the existence mm -hmm. of a creator, a personal creator that brings intelligence into the universe. So mm -hmm. this is the book, Return of the God Hypothesis by Stephen Meyer, an excellent scientist and philosopher and theologian himself. Yeah. I would, uh, Mark. oh, just uh, quickly on the question about plundering the Egyptians, or can we get something good out of uh, some of these ideologies? I usually, I, I just got more simple about this and, and apply a pragmatic test. I will seek to excavate any truth out of an ideology that actually has worked on the ground. And is there any place in, in Western history where Marx, since the inception of Marxism and these kinds of collective ideologies that have emerged, that it's worked at all. Yeah, good question. Is there any place it's worked? If it's worked somewhere, I will gladly plumb the depths to see what can be, what's parasitic on Christianity. And anyway, any truth we find is all God's truth and everything. So I apply the pragmatic test uh, in answering that plundering the Egyptians question. It I'm more work. Tertullian than Augustinian. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. say, no, don't need it. It hasn't worked anywhere. I'm not going to waste my time. Got better Christian resources to plumb. Yeah, I think, I think we're all familiar, building on your insight there, Mark, um, with the language of, you know, there's CRT, it's, it's not a worldview, critical race theory is just a tool, it can be a helpful tool, that's the language that's, that's being used that Stephen was pointing out as sort of a Christian attempt to extend a sort of olive branch, branch to the cultural zeitgeist, and, and the more I've thought about this, it, this is the image that sticks in my head is a black light is a tool for justice seekers. If you have a detective, there's a crime in a hotel room, he enters with a tool that is a black light and shines it around. Um, that might expose some blood, blood spatters on the wall. It might expose things that aren't there to the naked eye. Therefore, it's a useful tool. But the more I've researched CRT and building on Mark's insight, why it never works when these ideas are actually enacted in real life is because it's a busted tool. So it, it can't distinguish between, is that a blood spatter or is that just mustard or ketchup on mm. the wall? It, so, so it ends up calling everything a blood spatter. Everything is injustice. You know, there's that inequity over here. Um, there's that disparate outcome with speeding tickets on the New Jersey Turnpike. There's that disparate outcomes between uh, male and female in the tech industry of the Silicon Valley. There's that disparity over here. And it's just a busted tool that sees everything as a blood spatter. And what, happened, what would happen if a justice-seeking detective was using a busted blacklight? He'd be calling a lot of people criminals who weren't because this tool is lousy and can't distinguish between blood and mustard. And that's sort of where I'm, I'm headed in, in thinking about um, critical race theory, cultural Marxism, the way it's being applied in our culture right now. It's a broken black light that is particularly insidious in the church mm. because now you have all kinds of people being branded, you know, guilty and we're demanding repentance from them. And, you know, the black light showing mustard that, you know, isn't really blood. That's my yeah. two cents. I, I mean, without this sort of becoming a, 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 a sort of a, a talk on sort of Karl Marx himself, um, I've sort of come to the conclusion that over sort of years of reading Marx and about Marx that where Marx was most original, uh, he was wrong. And where he was <laughs> most correct, he wasn't original. So, hmm. you know, people us will usually say, well, Marx's maybe great insight is the relationship between economy and culture. If you want to understand how culture is unfolding, look at the economy. More specifically, probably look at, cl at the class conflict element of the economy. Yeah, arguably, that was not an original view. That was something sort of just deeply entrenched in Enlightenment views of history, which tended to see history as the unfolding of increasingly complex varieties of, of, of economy. Um, ranging from hunter gatherers at uh, sort of the the most sort of they would say the that they would have said in the 18th and 19th century the most primitive level up to the most complex level uh, that being sort of mercantile commerce and things like that so so marx's you know he's 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 his greatest insights probably weren't original and where he was original he tended to be wrong that's good well i guess as the neo-Marxists have proven they could not stay 
with his original insights mm. of mercantilism or econo economism and had to spread their whole analysis to the entire uh, cultural values mm. to mm -hmm. give any kind of meaning to what Marxism really could say. And even those things, you know, have been so over the top. Marxists like to, or neo-Marxists don't want to talk about uh, communism. They talk about dialectical materialism as if that's not as bad. They don't want to give the impression that they're really attacking the family. So they attack um, patriarchy. Mm. And they call that authoritarian per personality, which we must eliminate. But all these things are misleading in what's actually being discussed. But it's trying to extend Marx's analysis to other areas of society. Mark, you have, um, or some have said, excuse me, some have said that transracial concerns are impossible to fulfill without justice being done. And justice requires, as scripture talks about in some places, repayment of debt from theft, for instance. How can transracial concerns be pursued and fulfilled in the system itself, the one that drives our human interactions and pursuits of transracial relationships is twisted so favorably to one race? Wow. Oh. So I think the premise of the question is off a bit, actually. I think you can pursue justice through transracial means. In fact, I think that's the only way you can do it. Uh, for instance, why, there's a reason why Lady Liberty is blind. Why in the West we put a, uh, anchor, uh, you know, uh, what is it, a handkerchief over her eyes, a cloth over her uh, eyes. We now call it a mask. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, so she can't see the participants. It's kind of like, when you hire an, an, an orchestra member, you put up, a, you know, you hire them from behind a curtain so that the aesthetics don't influence you, right? When you're, when you're trying to hire a trombonist, they play behind a curtain for the, for the team. So justice can only come about if there is a disregard for other factors that are not germane to justice. Has a true, has a true harm been incurred? Uh, you know, justice asked the question, going back to Aristotle fundamentally, what is owed this person? So if something is stolen from them, it needs to be returned. That does in, in no way whatsoever impinge upon the identity of the person who has incurred the harm or the person who's done it, right? So I, I, again, I just would revise that question and say, you can't do justice um, if you pay attention to factors not germane to justice. So it's, it's going to be transracial. Now, I think it, it might be gesturing toward generational repair and things like that. Uh, you know, the 40 acres and the mule that we have here in America, the Japanese internment repay, all that stuff was intended to happen to people who were actually alive, who could actually demonstrate harm that happened to them personally, not successive generations down the road uh, where, it's where it's nearly impossible to actually adjudicate fairly what harm was incurred and how do we repair that right so if there are people still living and there are you know i was just talking my parents are in their 70s and uh people in the south and who are in their 70s and 80s actually saw actual harm done to them so i think there could be something that some some actual tangible repair for people who are still alive who actually experienced and, in, and injustice at the hands of, uh, you know, a county government or a local, local government or something like that. Um, and that would be, it would not be because, race would only factor in so much that the person who incurred the harm happens to be black in most instances in that case. Mm, yeah. I don't know if that answers, did I answer the question there? On that? That, that was helpful. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Let, let me just, this is a thought. This could be completely insane. Feel free to call me out for damnable heresy. Um, but I had a, th a thought this morning that for whatever reason popped into my head. Heresy. That, look, it, it's such a zero sum game right now in politics. Mm. Oh, you're already yeah. calling me heresy. You haven't even heard it. <laughs> Come on, man. Give me some slack. Um, what if, just to float the idea, people who lean more right, 
said, okay, if, uh, if reparations is the order of the day, um, let, let's pass a bill that all the money Planned Parenthood gets mm. from our tax dollars will go to helping black communities that are in economic devastation. That was my thought. Again, it could be a silly mm. policy solution, but I, th I think it'd be a helpful compromise. All right, every dollar that goes to funding the termination of tiny image bearers of God, mm. many of them black in cities like New York City, more black babies, more tiny black image bearers are aborted than are born. Mm. Yeah, if we wanna pull all funding from Planned Parenthood tomorrow, let's redirect some of that funds to black communities. How about those bill billions that have already been spent for the great society? Mm. Should that be counted in? Yeah. Exactly. As a way of contributing to the betterment of those who've been suffering. I, I do think that calculation has to be fair, taking mm. into account the massive amount that uh, the state has actually poured into these suffering communities. Mm. The only thing, uh, yeah, that is to your uh, Wild proposal. It's just a wacky idea. Not, it no, it popped as wacky into my head said. like two hours ago. And I, was like, I, oh. I think the the uh, one initial argument against it would be, if it's race based, you're actually going to include people who actually don't need the money. Yeah, you're going to be including a lot of middle class Black Americans, and I think I don't think justice is being fulfilled in a ideology in, in an ideal sense I think maybe largely justice might be fulfilled if you're if you're capturing mostly mostly uh, poor uh, people in, in, in po situations of poverty but you're going to be including some people who just don't need it college educated middle class uh, black sure. people who, who live in and live just happen to you know early in their marriage no kids yet and they live in a the poor oh, part of town but honestly if it's going there oh, rather than grandparenthood, I'm happy <laughs> it's okay. going there rather than Planned Parenthood. I'm happy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Absolutely. I agree with you. It's it's a yeah. I hear you. I mean, maybe a more, more targeted approach would. I mean, you know, with public policy, you always want to kind of go as narrow as you can. Um, so you're actually solving a tangible problem, and maybe mm. a more targeted approach to reparations. And I think there are good principled arguments for reparations. Uh, would be maybe to start with redlining. Um, uh, who who can show uh, that they probably were denied a loan or denied being able to buy a house in an area where they should have been allowed? Uh, and that might be sort of a place to start because if, if one thing affects uh, the economic circumstances of later generations, it's home ownership. So that may be a place to start uh, with reparations. Uh, th there are counter responses that might suggest something along the lines of, well, okay, reparations is good, but is it the state that in, in all instances should be making the reparations? Right. So for example, if, right. if a private loan company or a private realtor uh, were discriminating, shouldn't they be sued? Maybe as sort of a, a class action against those people is, is the best way forward. And then the, the, another response would be, well, actually, yeah, there is a, a very principled reason for reparations and, and maybe such reparations have been taking place for decades now um, with um, uh, certain elements of the welfare state. So uh, I actually think there are principled arguments for reparations, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we buy into what I would consider very, very simplistic um, responses to that by some people to the effect that okay well let's just give every every sort of uh, African American five hundred thousand dollars or something right. like that um, that would be a bad public policy response to a legitimate public policy question so what you're saying Stephen would it sounds like retribution to me um, because when you talk about reparations and, and it's specifically targeted toward African Americans you, we it's hard to avoid special pleading because if you can go back to the 40s with the Irish, the first half of the 20th century, who were treated worse in major northern cities than, than African Americans were, uh, it would have been easier for my grandparents to get a job in, in, in the boroughs of New York City in the 20s than an Irish immigrant. Uh, you know, they thought they were uncouth and, and liars, and they thought Black people were docile, hard workers. Walter Williams has, in his book on race and economics, has a little advertisement that you saw very commonly in, in little small white businesses in New York, they're saying no, you know, no Irish allowed, but, but African-Americans preferred, you know, something 
like that. So we got to, I don't want, I want to avoid special pleading by apportioning reparations on the basis of race. We have to include the Irish, Slavics that were treated poorly. Even back in, in, in colonial days when the, the swarmy German farmers who the patrician British didn't like, <laughs> right? They were suspicious of these German farmers, the Pennsylvania Dutch farmers, and treated them incredibly poorly and, and just didn't want them living near them. And yeah, that's, so I would just add, mm -hmm. If we're calling it reparations, retribution, whatever, if it's race based, it seems to be special pleading and it seems to be inherently working against the, the demands of true justice, which is uh, colorblind in my view. Sure. Yeah. A reasonable response, totally. Yeah. Thaddeus, haven't we Christians allowed ourselves to be positioned into a defensive posture by the social justice warriors? Doesn't our assertion that we are right just make this whole thing a shouting match? Um, ex expound on the question. There's, there's a lot of ways I can go with that, but I'm, I'm just not sure what's behind it so that I'm answering the right question. Yeah, I'm not quite certain, uh, but this one was, was pretty common it, that there is, uh, well, Neo-Marxism or CRT is the boogeyman or everything I don't like is critical race theory and neo-Marxism. And it just it's back and forth and we're not making any progress forward. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. So, so maybe, um, you know, I talk about this in, in my last book, the Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth book. Um, something I refer to as the Newman effect. I think, Josh, you and I talked about this for a little bit on the podcast not too long ago. Uh, but the Newman effect, I'm borrowing from the, the viral 2018 uh, Jordan Peterson uh, interview with uh, the UK's Channel 4, <laughs> Kathy Newman. And everything Peterson said, she had this phrase that quickly turned into a meme. So you're saying women just aren't smart enough to run these top companies. So you're saying we should arrange our societies to be like lobsters, so you're saying trans activists could lead to the genocide of millions. And, and at every turn, Peterson was like, no, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. But, but she chose to take, because his nuanced points didn't fit into her polarized worldview, um, she had to interpret everything in the most cartoonish, inflammatory, and damnable way possible. Uh, and, and I argue in, in the book that that's, we're all, in a certain sense, we're all Kathy Newmans now. And so if somebody says, um, you know, you should wear a mask, then we jump to, well, therefore you, you hate freedom and love tyranny, or you shouldn't wear a mask, therefore you hate grandmas and want more vulnerable people to die. Or if a brother or sister in Christ says racism is still a problem, well, what's the easy thing? Well, clearly you're a neo-Marxist, or clearly you're uh, you bought into the CRT heresy, or you think this or that case of alleged racism maybe isn't racism. Okay, you, you're obviously alt right. You obviously are some kind of far right fascist neo Nazi, and. This isn't just the cultural moment. This is in the church now in a way that um, just this morning, um, the Gospel Coalition um, published uh, an article that I had written or a chapter I had written for a new book they have coming out. Um, and I'm talking about social justice in the chapter that they posted. And I'm arguing against Marxist forms of social justice in the article. But all you got to do is click. But just this morning, I got called probably 25 names um, of people who just saw the word social next to the word justice and were like, here we go again, another Marxist, commie, heretical infiltrator from the Social Justice Coalition, the, the Social Gospel Coalition. And, and it's like, man, it, that's part of the problem and why Josh, to the original question, we're always on the defensive. is because mm -hmm. we're oftentimes so quick to just assume the worst of other people's motives, which we'd be quick to indict the left for uh, if they s say, oh, well, you know, you're citing Thomas Sowell because, you know, you're a, a coon or a race traitor or an Oreo. That's the only reason we we'd call foul. 
and say, that's not really fair. You aren't really hearing somebody out in their perspective. And I have a lot of um, Christian brothers and sisters who are seeing that happen on both sides of the political spectrum. And, and a lot of it is just to bring it all back to scripture. A lot of it's just straight up bearing false witness. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's just straight up slander. And so before we critique an idea, we need to be crystal clear on the idea we're critiquing and not go tarring and feathering other people's viewpoints with like Kathy Newman, the most damnable cartoonish and inflammatory version possible. Mm. Now that's Mm. not to say we don't take a bold stand against false ideas. I'm convinced that a lot of the stuff wrapped up in CRT and the social justice movement is straight up insidious and anti-gospel to its core. But tactically, if we're going to engage that, we can't indulge in the Newman effect or we're just alienating people we could otherwise reach. John. Yes, sir. Here's a question. My concern is where the church stands on these issues. Even good churches seem to be just avoiding this issue while their congregations, especially younger generations in the church, are being swooped in on these issues, how do we challenge our churches to take on these issues in a more active way to make sure their congreg- our congregations understand the difference between biblical social justice and this worldly social justice that is confusing many in our congregations? Yeah, that I don't have a maybe a great... Um pithy answer to that that sounds really intellectually astute. I mean, it's pretty simple for me. I think uh, pastors um, do need to obviously be in the Bible, understanding what biblical justice is. They need to, to be in both Testaments. Um, mm-hmm. But I think um, one of the weaknesses I've noticed is, uh, and, and this goes to even um, some people that are now um, listening to, to my podcast, They've, they've said to me that they were just completely unaware about any of this. And, and I wondered, hmm. well, well, where have you been? Have you, have you been, um, ha- have you thought about the fact that the high schoolers in your church, many of them are going to hmm. go off to college. And hmm. I mean, are you at least rudimentarily aware of some of the ideas that they're going to be facing there? And I think the answer often is no, there, there's just, there's a bubble hmm. sometimes. And um, there, the, sometimes parents also fit into this. They're just not aware. They're not, you know, we're so busy with life. It's very hard to um, understand like when critical race theory, right. That term, when that started being discussed, people were like critical, what, like, what are you talking about? And so, um, so my encouragement has been uh, to, to not just uh, be in the word, which we need to be in, but also um, just be a little bit aware. I mean, just talk to the college students in your church and ask them, Kind of what they're learning. I mean, even that kind of a conversation, I think, can kind of put some, some things on your radar that might not have been there uh, before. And, um, and then when you're preaching through uh, books of the Bible, if you're you know, in exegetical preaching, um, apply you know, what you're preaching through to the current situation. And I often see a lot of missed opportunities there because there's so many scriptures that address aspects of this. And, and if you're um, ideally uh, if you're not doing exegetical preaching, or if you are doing it, maybe take a few weeks and do a topical, you know, really study this out and, and make your church aware of what these things are and um, how to answer them biblically. So not, that's not rocket science and, and maybe <laughs> it's not the most elevated, you know, um, answer, uh, you know, with insights, but it's, it's simple in my mind. It's just, we have to put some hard work in, unfortunately, and, mm. and uh, that's what we're called to do. So mm-hmm. I do think uh, one of the great problems in churches these days is that people don't are afraid to raise the issues. Mm. Um, Concerned that their neighbor or their friend will take a totally different position than they do. And so the solution is to not say anything. But the problem is that we become suspicious of our church member friends. And I don't know what it will take for pastors to take this on, but I would encourage real honesty and boldness to sit down and talk this through. Mm. To get people laying on the table what they think they think, what they think they know is the fact 
And then for a church to start really dealing with ideology and mm. the truth of the gospel, the way Thaddeus develops in his book, which I found to be extremely good, so solid. But I think we're afraid of one another these days. Mm. Mm. It's not a good situation. Yeah, I, I would just add one fine point on, on what Peter and John had to say, which is, um, you know, Francis Schaeffer at the Labrie Fellowships emphasized orthodoxy plus orthopraxy, and that's mm. just embedded in their daily rhythms. Mm. And so I've, I've been out to Labrie, I think, eight times now over the years, and they just did a, such a great job of capturing my, you know, Schaefer's whole thing about the lordship of Jesus over the entire person. And so I know for me, I had a tendency to get too top heavy where my head was filled up with all ideas that I could just fall over, but my, my heart and my hands weren't really in action. And so I'd go from, you know, two hours of reading Abraham Kuyper um, for study time. And then it's tea time where I'm sitting around and meeting people who are different from me. And then like four hours working a farm in the Dutch countryside. Uh, and, and there was just an integration there that mm -hmm. if we aren't modeling that to our young people, yeah. they're easy targets for social justice ideologies because like, well, at least they're doing something. You know, I'm at this church and it's all talk and we can debate eschatology or soteriology till we're blue in the face, but we all just sit on our thumbs. Um, so for me, my parents, when I, the way I was raised, they were preaching the gospel and I spent a big chunk of my childhood in the potato fields and strawberry orchards and orange orchards, um, working side by side with the poor so that later when all this social justice bee propaganda was coming mm. my way that like, oh, Christians are always on the wrong side of history. Christians don't give a rip about the poor. Christians are haters and phobics. I had a whole childhood to look back on to be like, that's just propaganda. You know, I could see through it like glass because my church and my parents did a good job of showing me that um, it's the gospel first and as an implication of the gospel, you love your neighbor. I think that's mm. an important point that Schaefer certainly got right. Yeah, there was a study couple studies done, I think, a few years ago on sticky faith, on how uh, children carry the faith of their parents into the next generation, and what were the factors that determined where, that showed, what were the variables that determined success, basically, and, and I think the number one factor was a kind of active, engaged faith of the parents, as opposed to sort of just head knowledge, reading Kuiper, talking about it, so it was, it was kind of to Thaddeus' point, the orthodoxy and the orthopraxy together number of studies done to that effect that yeah. covenant successful covenant succession is primarily tied to active faith in the home yep. uh, for the children so so catechist pieces plus practice well said the other the other thing i think sort of um speaking uh to the issue of how to sort of how do we get church the church to understand and think deeply and critically about what many of us would consider unhelpful um, approaches to social justice is to remember that we're kind of right now going through another Gutenberg press moment mm. where you know, access to information and the ability to sort of disseminate information is again uh, much greater now than it has been in, in, in fact in hundreds of years and so you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the question was, how can we get pastors to understand what we're trying to say? There's a sense in which nowadays we, we don't really, I mean, it's good to get the pastors on board, but given the power of social media, you know, you can go straight directly to the people now. And if the pastor's not interested, you can still make very <laughs> engaging videos, very engaging podcasts, very brief blogs speaking directly to, to the parishioners. And so we shouldn't forget that maybe the main uh, weapon that we have, uh, earthly speaking, is the power of social media. And so my, my response to that question is just sort of keep making high quality, really, really engaging content, uh, because a lot of people... Uh, do actually access it and it does actually sort of it does make a difference um, the other thing is you know if you're in a discussion with people on issues of, of social justice maybe point out some of the fruits of uh, 
of, of critical theory approaches to mm. gender, sexuality, and race. So what are the fruits that we've seen, you know, over the last 10 years? Have they been racial reconciliation or mm. over the last 10 years have things actually got worse? Uh, so that's one thing. You don't want to be glib and, and smug about that, but it is something that, that should be pointed out. You know, by an ideology's fruits, you shall know it. And that is something that several of you have already sort of mentioned. But the other thing, and this sort of gets back to uh, something uh, John said as well, like, you, you know, some of us, not necessarily everyone, but some people have to put in the hard work. And it may be the case. I mean, my background is in the history of Christian political thinking. And historically in the church, you've had people... You've had theologians and Christian thinkers who've made it one of their prime duties to understand society, to understand politics, and try to write deeply on it from a, a Christian and biblical and theological point of view. And probably we need more Christians sort of taking that as their mission, sort of theologians saying, right, I could look at zoteriology, I could look at eschatology. In fact, what I'm actually going to do is, is kind of revive this other tradition of trying to understand what's going on in society from a, a Christian point of view. Of course, Kuiper was sort of great at that as well, but literally uh, Christian thinkers making it their mission to understand things like contemporary ideologies. Because one of the problems that I, I find when I read theologians talking about things like social justice and, and things that are happening right now in the world is that they're really good at theology but they really know very little about other things like sociology, political science, the nature of ideologies, uh, political philosophy, and consequently their analysis tends to be very superficial. And you get to an end, the end of a blog or a video and you think to yourself, okay, um, what in that was really clear? And, and, and mm. usually the answer is not very much. Um, and so I think to so have some people sort of just sort of say, look, I'm gonna actually make it my life's work now as a theologian, as a Bible scholar, to understand something like critical race theory or Black Lives Matter or capitalism or the capitalism socialism debate. So I can speak persuasively into that and create content for people who want it. Mm. Stephen, Stephen there's point. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, Stephen, there are some traditions that would reject that idea and that they would say that the pastor's job is for the word and the sacraments, that they, they have no business going into that other lane how would you respond to that um i would say that the two are not mutually exclusive and i would suggest that there's probably no biblical reason to think that that is true uh, especially considering the apostle paul devotes a whole chapter of the book of romans to the question of how do we understand earthly authority how should we understand our relationship with taxation and things like that but i'd also say that historically in terms of just the history of the church that's just simply not been the practice so biblically there's really no reason to think that that sort of cloistered off um purely pietistic approach is the approach to what it is to be a pastor uh, and secondly the history of the church and certainly the history of, of protestantism and certainly the history of calvinism mm. um, would suggest that it's completely false yeah, Stephen, what you said i thought was really good about um what how much does a pastor or an elder church leader leader in christianity know outside of uh, just Christian doctrine or uh, interpreting the word of God. Those things are so important and they need to be there. But I, I think back to even Titus, um, that they are to hold firmly the, the faithful word um, so that they will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. And obviously mm. when it comes to cults like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or even other religions like Islam, uh, no one approaches that and thinks, you know, let's say you live in a community that's predominantly Muslim, like in uh, Dearborn, Michigan or something, you don't think, well, it, it wouldn't be helpful for me to know about Islam. I just need to know the word of God. No, you'd think, well, I, I do need to know something about the people that I live near. And we live in a culture right now that is thoroughly uh, saturated in neo-Marxist categories and thought. And so you have to know about this some, some way. Um, and, and, and that's just common sense. Uh, you won't be able to fulfill the obligation to refute those who contradict if you don't even know where they're coming from. How many pastors, this is, to pick one example, know how a market economy works? And I, and I mean, because I've heard this so many times. Um, well, you know, if, uh, if you're paying for a new car, I, I, I won't say the name, but I remember one pastor said, a prominent one said it was a sin to buy a new car. 
Because if you're paying for a new car, you know, you could have been feeding all these other people, you could have been doing something else. And I mean, number one, that's Phariseeism. But, but number two, I, I just had to wonder, you know, does this person know how this works? You're actually employing people when you pay for that new car <laughs> and they're feeding their children because you bought that new car. And so I'm not saying whether or not someone should buy one. I've never bought one. All my, my car has over 300,000 miles on it, but um, it's, it's really helpful to at least understand uh, the things that you're talking about when you talk about them. Otherwise, mm. you can't faithfully apply the scripture to them and you won't be able to refute those who contradict. Good. Stephen, what is the telos of the Great Awakening? What does success look like according to the advocates? You had said in your lecture, it must end in misery, but the woke must have a brighter view. What is that? Yeah, great question. Um, the, the, the ultimate telos of the Great Awakening, uh, the Great Awakening, uh, is basically to dismantle every vestige of Christianity in our culture, in our institutions, in our practices, in the way that we think, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, gender and sexuality. Um, and, and also, and, and this sounds sort of more positive, to dismantle all vestiges of historic racism in those same uh, in those same things, our practices, our institutions, uh, and in the ways that we think. Um, and one of the ways that, that they will relate that to Christianity is basically by saying, well, well, Christianity has been one of the great uh, perpetrators of racism in the past. And consequently, that's, uh, we, we still need to you know, dismantle sort of Christianity from a, a, a racial uh, point of view. So yeah, the great telos of it is essentially the same as the, the, the telos of, of, of the French Revolution, the telos of the Bolshevik Revolution, basically to start history again from year zero mm. um, in the name of certain abstract ideals like equality, uh, nowadays, diversity and things like that. And uh, to put it another way, uh, the, the telos of the great awakening or the telos of wokeness um, is a kind of sexual gender anarchy. Um, hmm. and, and by anarchy, I don't necessarily mean chaos because the two things are different, but, but the idea that there should be absolutely nothing determining uh, sexuality the expression of sexuality or the expression of gender other than individual will everything should just be an expression of individual will and so there's a sense in which the great awakening and wokeness is sort of the product of of there's a sense in which it's the product of three great historical thinkers Karl Marx uh, for his emphasis on, on struggle and being liberated from struggle, Friedrich Nietzsche with his emphasis on sort of the will to power, and Michel Foucault with his emphasis yeah. that all knowledge claims are merely power plays. And so, yeah, what, what is the, the telos of the Great Awakening? Um, a pure liberation from any idea that there is a created order which should inform the way we think about gender and sexuality and pure and full liberation from all historical practices regarding those things uh, including race relations and the race relations is a slightly different issue and the way wokeism thinks about race is far more marxist um, than the way it thinks about sexuality and gender, which is far more Foucauldian and postmodern, but not mm. to forget that Foucault and postmodernism were to a large extent uh, influenced by Marxism. Yes. Uh, so ultimately to overturn a kind of created order in the way that we think, and that's of course why it will lead to misery, because the way God tells us to think about ourselves and to think about him and to think about how we resolve conflicts with one another is deeply yeah. related to the human nature that he gave yeah. us which is why deviations from it must, in the long run, lead to immiserization, to use a Marxist mm. term. Mm. Okay. Which I think, as you describe it very clearly, mm. is part of the love of the neighbor. Mm. That we involve ourselves in cultural studies and in trying to understand what is happening not because we want to be right, but because we believe that God's way of creating the world is for the love of the neighbor. Yeah. And I think we can justify that very well. 
This question is for everyone uh, to jump in on. Thoughts on cancel culture? Isn't Christianity the original cancel culture? Take, for example, when Target was allowing transgenders to use their bathrooms, Starbucks, or even the latest event with cuties on Netflix. I can go if no one else wants to jump in. <laughs> so um, the, there probably is a lot that could be said about this, but the the fundamental kind of core of cancel culture, the, the presupposition behind it seems to be the um, wanting to take away someone's civil liberties ultimately. Hmm. And so if, if you know that the people that are most passionate about this, if they had the uh, sanction of the government, they would certainly use it to quell uh, whatever speech they find disagreeable in the public square or to partition it off to somewhere else. So sometimes they don't need that. They can, you know, corporation can do it for them. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's a totalitarian move against speech that is um, disagree, they disagree with. And it seems like Christians uh, primarily, at least in the, in the last you know, 100 years or so in, in Western context, they don't see it quite that way. There have been, uh, I'm sure, fundamentalists um, uh, who have uh, thought a little bit in those terms. But the thing is, they often retreat to their own ghettos, kind of, their own cultural ghettos. They don't necessarily try to um, all the time uh, push out by taking away civil liberties another group. And that's the key part there is by taking away civil liberties. They, they want to compete in the marketplace. They want to sometimes pressure organizations, you know, through boycotts and so forth. This has happened to stop platforming something they consider to be evil. But generally, they're not talking about let's ruin the reputation of a person. Let's, you know, make it so that they can never have any redemption whatsoever to come back into the public sphere. And that's exactly what cancel culture does. It is a permanent disqualification from playing in the sandbox with everyone else. <laughs> yeah, else? I mean, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think all, probably no doubt all of us will have something to say about this. I mean, yeah, cancel culture is essentially what you get uh, with the decline of cultural Christianity. You mm. get the decline of the notion of forgiveness, mm. and uh, you know, cancel culture by definition uh, is 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 an absence of forgiveness. I mean, and, and what John, in terms of defining cancel culture, you know, cancel culture is is basically just destroying people's um, reputations in order for them not to be able to enjoy uh, certain uh, certain rights that you know we, we all should have in liberal democracies uh, and one of those is to enjoy the right to pursue a career uh, so can cancel culture is a funny thing it, it's been it's actually been around in some ways it's been around for decades I mean it's it's not it's not for nothing it's not because of nothing that universities for example have become full of left-leaning of, of ideologically left-leaning people that didn't happen by accident that happened because for decades uh, conservatives in classes conservatives applying for jobs were excluded um graded down and made to feel excluded from universities and and the 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 the, the outcome of that is that universities are predominantly left-wing now, uh, particularly in the humanities departments. That has not always historically been the case, as anyone who knows the history of universities would testify to. So, so you know what cancel culture is? This is my, my take on it. Cancel culture is the, is the identity politics left doing to mainstream progressive leftists what mainstream progressive leftists have been doing to conservatives for about the last 50 years. Mm. That's what cancel culture is. And that's the only reason people are talking about cancel culture now is because it's happening to people on the progressive left. There's nothing mm. really new about it. Okay, there is one thing that's new about it, and that is that social media has sort of made it explode at the, at the sort of the popular realm. But the idea of people's reputations and careers being destroyed or stopped because of their conservative ideological um, predilections, if you like, is nothing new. Uh, it's just it's now happening to people in the progressive left. And so that's why we're hearing about it now. Um, you know, obvious, you know, when you read the Bible, the Bible's emphasis, um, you know, like, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 5 to 7, we destroy arguments. Uh, cancel culture seeks to destroy people. It can't distinguish between a point of view and an argument and a person. It simply cannot do it. 
uh, the Bible in Isaiah, come let us reason, uh, cancel cultures, come let us pile on this person and make sure that we make such an example of them that no one ever dares utter that thought ever again. Mm. Cancel mm -hmm. culture is essentially what you get in a, in a culture where forgiveness um, has fallen into the peripheries of social ideals. Mm. I've, uh, yeah. I've been thinking about this as well. Um, you, uh, Stephen, you mentioned identity. It seems to me that cancel culture has arisen with the loss of any kind of ultimate meaning outside of oneself. Mm. Uh, in terms of, you know, creator and the structures of creation. And once you get rid of those, people don't know what to make of themselves. And so they give themselves an identity. <laughs> and that identity becomes very closely guarded. And so if you seem to be saying something that attacks their identity, they will take you down. Mm -hmm. So I think we are right. living in the results of a culture that's lost any ultimate understanding of existence, where everyone subjectively has to establish who or who he or she is and fight to the very bottom of the pack until we've got our way. And I, I think if that is true, then the ultimate answer is for the Christian church to rediscover the ideology of its basic beliefs in God, the creator, and we creatures. And that's to love human beings is to bring that message to them. Well said. I, I would just add briefly, um, you know, I, I was raised in the 90s where it was very much the heyday of postmodern moral relativism and anything goes. And I think what we're seeing right now on a culture wide level is that relativism, like every other time in Western history that it's come into vogue, it has a shelf life, it doesn't last that long because it's so fundamentally out of sync with the way mm. God designed us. We're, we're designed mm. not just to invent our own identities out of thin air or to fabricate our own meaning and mystery of existence out of, out of the nothingness, um, but we're actually, it's why um, the Lord of the Rings trilogy blows up. It's why mm. the Matrix trilogy blows up. It's why mm -hmm. the Star Wars movies blow up is because these movies give us a moral melodrama mm. that we it, it resonates with part of the way god designed us was to wage war against the cosmic principalities for the sake of the glory of god and if that soul deep existential need has been starved for a generation mm. then you're just setting things up for the resurgence of some form of vicious in this case as secular absolutism Mm. The people, it gives them a moral crusade without all the inconvenience of having to bow the knee to Jesus Yeah, for yeah. many people. And I would just add to that, jumping back to Stephen's point about, you know, once forgiveness is off the table, then you end up with this vindictive form of cancel culture. This is one of the reasons I'm really convinced that um, so much of the social justice ideology is a false gospel because it gives me a way, if I'm canceling the people who are on the wrong side of history, you know, in quotes, if I'm counseling, if, if I'm canceling the bigots and the phobics and the haters, then what does that do for my identity? It satisfies another soul deep existential need, a need for the not guilty sentence, a need to mm. feel like what a psychologist, Elizabeth Nolan Brown describes as um, we need to be, quote, a very good person, right? We all need justification, whether mm. that's the Hindu jumping into the Ganges, whether that's the Jew at the Wailing Wall, whether that's the Catholic in the confessional booth, we all long for justification. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so this social justice ideology gives me a way of feeling justified, like I'm a very good person mm. apart from Christ. See, I wanted Kevin Hart canceled because he made a gay joke 10 years ago. Therefore, I'm woke. Therefore, I'm a good person. See, I wanted, you know, fill in the blank with the headline of the day. So coming out as a theologian, I see that 
building on Peter's point is that vacuum of meaning has been filled up with a false gospel of yeah. justification by hashtag, justification mm. by hashtagging solidarity. I think it uh, that's a profound point, just jumping off on the kind of theological counterfeit theology underneath it. I see it as a kind of secular excommunication. And also I see the kind of purging of like an Epstein or a great sinner, you know, from polite society and canceling them. It's kind of counterfeit atonement. Um, it's transferring this sin, whatever it is, sexual abuse, pedophilia, homophobia or whatever onto a person and sending them out into the wilderness. So I really think we can kind of recover. It's kind of postmodern Leviticus, um, uh, just recovering a sort of transfer uh, idea of sin, putting it on somebody. People are looking for a savior, just like, you know, Thaddeus profoundly talked about how they're looking for self-justification. They're looking for a savior as well. They're looking for a way to pur a purgation, to pur purge, purge our sins. So I think that's something that can kind of be a point, a point of contact to, get, you know, to take up Van Til and see, say, see, you, you're able to shame things, but you're, you're mis it's misplaced. You're looking for a way to purge from society, right? Because uh, one way of looking at sin is, you know, Leviticus shows how it's a very social thing, a pollutant that, that corrupts the people, not just an individual law-breaking thing. So I think there's an opportunity there for a point of contact to really talk with people who are thoughtful and use a little bit Gerard and the Mises, how we're imitating uh, 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 activity. So everybody jumps on Kevin Hart. It's not just one person, it's people imitating the, one, the, the next person who's doing it. So there's an opportunity, I think, to explore atonement, transfer, purging, excommunication, shaming, right? This gets us, this gestures toward a biblical notion of sin and its effects and consequences. That's very profound. Well said. Gentlemen, thank you for being a part of the symposium. Pastor Mark Robinson, John Harris, Dr. Jones, Dr. Shavura, and Dr. Williams. We appreciate you all very much and the work you put into the symposium. Thank you all.